Our message tonight is Christ makes men new. Ladies, you too. <laughs> Christ makes mankind. Christ makes men and women new. We talked last week about responding to God's invitation, responding to all of the things he's put forward for mankind through faith. And that we have a responsibility to respond in faith and, and to accept what he's put forward. But it's interesting to me, and I think sometimes when we talk about these things, we're a little prone to looking at some of the denominations and, and point out about how they're able to do this. But we talk about faith sometimes as though it's an intellectual exercise. It's about what you believe. That faith is accepting Jesus Christ in an intellectual way. But the kind of faith that we were getting at last week, the kind of faith that I believe Jesus, that God is seeking, is more than that faith, than just a belief. In fact, James, I think, points that out so well when he states that if you believe there's one God or God is one, you do well but the demons also believe and tremble. You see, that kind of faith or that kind of belief obviously is not a saving belief. Jesus has not given his life on Calvary so that we can be the same old Mike, Stephanie, Shirley, or Dean. Jesus is asking us to respond in the kind of faith that involves following his path. But what's interesting is that we get some help along the way. Have you ever had directions you've had trouble following? Yeah, I certainly have. I've, I've had directions and got all kinds of confused. Anna's hands up, I know for certain she's had directions, she's had trouble following, right? Got off track a little bit. And, and such can be the way with life. But what we're talking about today, and I think the verse that Kevin read from 2 Corinthians 5.17 emphasizes that those who are in Christ are made a new, King James says, creature, uh, ESV says creation. We are something new. That means as we look at so many passages in scripture, it's emphasized over and over again that we put the old paths, the old man aside and live a new life. I do not believe it can be overemphasized that the Christian walk is about a life of action. The Christian walk is not merely about avoiding unrighteousness, but it's about participating in righteousness, in showing the love of God, in showing the caring and mercy of God to our mankind, to other uh, fellow man. It's a new life. It's more, it is not a self-improvement program. We had, I think, a great self-improvement program uh, throughout the month of January and February here with the financial fitness program. That was a self-improvement program. Those that participated in it went there with the mind of improving an aspect of their life and making it better. But you see, that's not what Christianity is. Christianity isn't about Improving yourself, Christianity is about becoming something entirely new. Clear down to our very most inner parts. You see, on Sunday mornings, we have finished the list of the deeds of the flesh. But God does not simply want us not to not participate in these things. He wants us to desire to do good things, to not desire to do bad things. 
There's a difference there, isn't there? It's not enough that I don't smack Amanda tonight. Right? That's not going to satisfy her. She's going to be upset and disappointed if I want to and still refrain from it. And I think I, I use that example to, to be a little bit humorous, but also to be relatable. That God, our Christian walk, is about changing our motives. It's about changing who we are and living a life that is surrendered to Jesus Christ himself. If you would, turn your Bibles to John, the first chapter. And we'll look here at the first point that enables God to make men new as Christ is the true light. Jesus Christ is the true light. In chapter 1, verse 9, we read the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. The true light, which is giving light to every, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. The idea here that we have true light is not one of, uh, of false versus true. What John is not saying is that Jesus Christ is the true light versus a light that's corrupted or not true. The idea here of the true light is the actual light, the primary light versus secondary light. When we read that Jesus Christ is the true light, what John is saying is he's the source of light. He's the only source of light on the earth. When we step out here tonight in just an hour or so, it's going to be dark outside and the sun will be providing some, excuse me, <laughs> that's almost true, the moon will be providing some amount of light for us to see. But that's not the true light. The true light in that instance is the sun because the moon is doing no more than reflecting the light that was provided from the sun. And what we read here is that Jesus is that true light in the sense that he's the primary. He is the light. He's the only source of light. This word light is a favorite phrase or favorite word of the uh, Apostle John as he writes his book. For it is used 23 times in this book referring to righteousness or to Jesus Christ. Notice here that it was coming into the world. And translators are divided on whether the light was coming into the world or whether the light was shedding on those who were coming into the world. In the Greek, it's very ambiguous. and It could be translated either way. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, King James translates it one way and many translations translate the other way. But either way, it's equally true. That Jesus is the light that lightens men, gives them light as they come into the world. And at the time that John was writing this, Jesus was shedding that light in an entirely new way. His truth was coming into the world and being made known to the world, being proclaimed to the world in a way that it had not been prior to this. In verses 10 through 11, we read, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. We see that Jesus came into the world. The world here means more than just creation. In fact, as John uses it, I mentioned he used the word light a lot of times, 23 times throughout his account of the gospel. He uses this word world, 80 times and it's not so much the physical creation but it is the physical aspect of mankind the spiritual state of mankind the spirituality of mankind separate and apart from God it is separated as we're going to see once we get into Ephesians from the ruler of this world there's a ruler in this world other than Jesus Christ other than God and when John says that Jesus came into the world, he's saying not only that he came to the world, but he came into a corrupt, 
state, a corrupt place. But Jesus didn't just step into a bunch of strangers, did he? Verse 10, as we read, said that, or excuse me, 11, that he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. It's my understanding that most likely the first uh, own, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. The first own is the type of word that is used for a dwelling place. Likely, what the, John is saying is Jesus came home and his family did not receive him. We know in the physical sense that Jesus came to the Jewish people. He came to the land of Israel and he was rejected far and wide throughout that land. How incredible to come home and to not be received in your own home or by your own family. But such was the case with the true light. In verse 12 and 13 though, we see a positive side. Verse 11, 10 and 11 talks about rejection. But verses 12 and 13 talks about those who accepted him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I'm sorry, I missed 11 or 12. No, I was right with 12. I just need to continue. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see, as I mentioned prior, verses 10 and 11 talks about the world rejecting Jesus Christ. It talks about his own home place rejecting him. It talks about his own family rejecting him. But the news is not all bad. It's interesting to me that Jesus Christ seems to be focused on the positive. Jesus Christ seems to be focused on those who do accept him. He knew what the state was before he ever came into the world, and yet he died that miserable death that we remembered this morning. Why? Because there would be those who accept him. I think that's an important point. I believe on average a salesman hears somewhere around 100 to 125 no's before he says, here's a yes. And the very best of salesmen will tell you every time you hear no, this may sound familiar, Whitey. You've heard something like this out of me before. Every time you hear the word no, that simply means there's one more off the checklist and you're that much closer to the yes. The reason I say that is, was that a no out of him? It sure sounded it. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> But every time we hear a no, that puts us that much closer to a yes. If men are willing for a living, for a paycheck, for a commission, to hear no after no after no, but continue until they hear the yes, as Christians, we ought to be willing to endure the no's and continue preaching the gospel for the sake of those who will say yes. If Jesus Christ would have been like Mike. The world would be a miserable place for one. But he may have got caught up in all of the no's. He may have been caught up in all of the rejection that he was going to suffer throughout his life. The sacrifice that was going to go to waste in the hearts and minds of so many. And he may have said, no, it's not even worth it. But thanks be the God that we are able to read in verse 12. But to those all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children. It's changed the world. It's changed the life of those clear back 2,000 years ago through this very current day. It's changed the life of all those who've truly accepted Jesus Christ. And it has changed the world for the better. How amazing is it that we are giving the right to become sons, to become children of the Heavenly Father. 
You know, the Jews understood this on Sunday mornings we've been studying about the foreshadowing of the Old Testament. And I believe that one of the reasons that God used a physical kingdom based on a fa family or based on birth into that kingdom is because it would foreshadow in contrast what we have in the New Testament. We see here in verse 13, it's not by flesh and blood, or it's not by flesh of man, nor is it by the will of man, but of God that we become children. That means it doesn't matter what family I'm born into. I have the right in Jesus Christ to become a child. You see, the Jews were caught up in their genealogy, rightly so because of the nature of the Old Testament. But if you were born a Jew, you were given wonderful blessings of God. If you were born a Gentile, as I would assume all of us here have been, you were born outside that covenant, outside those promises, outside those blessings of Jesus Christ. But here John points out that because of the true light, those who believe and accept Jesus Christ have the right to become sons, no matter what family you were born into. Furthermore, it doesn't come by the will of man. I think that's interesting because you can't vote me in or out. <laughs> it's of God. Boy, every physical organization gets political in one way or another, doesn't it? If you know the right people, things are going to go easy for you. If you've upset the wrong people, things are going to go difficult for you. See, I am happy that there's no earthly board, there's no voting committee that votes Mike Smith in or out. And I'm happy that God has given me the right because of the new creation that he's made me to become the Son of God. As you turn your Bibles over, if you would, to Ephesians, the second chapter, I'm not going to wear your fingers out tonight because we're going to spend the remainder of our time here in the book of Ephesians. But in Ephesians 1, chapter 2, and verses 1 through 3, we see the nature of mankind separate and apart from Jesus Christ, the fact that we are dead in sin. Starting in verses, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we read, And you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience. You were dead in trespasses of sins. You're reading from the King James here, you may see in italicized words, and he has quickened you. The reason anytime you see italicized words in the King James, uh, those are words that have been added for understanding's sake. And what the translators are trying to do is to help us understand that we were dead, but there's hope. Now, there's no indication in the manuscripts of those words being there, but certainly it's in the context of the verses prior and after that verse. In fact, look at verse 5, if you would, and you see that very statement being made. Even when you were dead in our trespass, trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. For by grace are you saved. You know, when I deal with mankind, I want to be like the King James translators here. If they'd just been patient in my mind, the whole idea that we were made quickened, we were quickened or made alive, comes around by verse 5. But in talking about being dead in the trespasses of sin, they can't, get to, can't wait to get to the part that Jesus or God has made us alive. And that's the nature of the gospel of Christ being truly good news. Because we are dead in our trespasses. Now, what does that mean? I hear all the time, and I believe that at points in my life, I've struggled with this question. It said, if we serve a loving God, how can he condemn the majority of mankind to hell? If I serve a loving God, 
then He will love me. He will take care of me no matter what I do. Well, how can you believe in a God who is so mean and intolerant they wipe out the entire earth? I think throughout most of my life I've misunderstood the nature of sin. I've misunderstood God's nature in many ways. Because look at verse 2, if you would. You were dead in trespasses of sin. There's no mention here that God has made you dead. You were simply dead in the trespasses of your sin. Verse 2, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of this air, the spirit that is now works in the sons of disobedience. What were we following? What are you following if you are not rolled by Jesus Christ? I touched upon this this morning in our Bible study. But Adam and Eve did not seem to be overly defiant. They did not seem to harbor any ill will towards God. They did not want to reach out and punish God. What were Adam and Eve after? But to simply walk with the freedom of no one telling them what to do and what not to do. Isn't that the promise that Satan made Eve? He said, you will become like God. Well, that means no one can tell me what to do. Amanda can't tell me to pick up my socks. Amanda can't tell me to take out the garbage. The kids can't tell me that they want fed. They don't anyhow. They tell Amanda. <laughs> right? We want freedom. But isn't it interesting that in striving for freedom, they left the presence of God, and when they left the presence of God, they became enslaved. Isn't it interesting that every sin in our lives does precisely that? It promises us pleasure. It promises us freedom. It promises us all kinds of blessings. But it ends up constraining and enslaving those who submit to it. He says of that dead trespass in which you once walked following the course of this world. Following the prince of the power of the air. The word air here has to do with that physical world that we were talking about in the book of John. The fact that we're in a place that is corrupted. And here we see that there is a prince in this world. There is a prince who is active, that was active in Eve's life. And said, come, I will give you freedom. And enslaved her. And there is a prince that when we follow the nature of this world that we are enslaved to. I'm not sure if I drew this final point out or made it clear or not. But death is the result of the absence of the presence of God. You see, God doesn't have to strike us dead. Jesus Christ is life. He's the true life. He's the only life. He is the light of this world. And when God withdraws his presence, we are worse than nothing. How could God condemn the world to hell? How could God allow the evil and the suffering that takes place in this life? All these things, I believe, are showing the absence of God's presence. We wanted freedom. And we have submitted ourselves to an awful roller. In verse 3. Among whom ye once lived in the passions of our flesh. Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And were by nature children of wrath. Like the rest of mankind. <laughs> Some interesting words here. Did you catch that in the beginning? Among whom. Being the sons of disobedience. 
that we saw at the end of verse 2. We all once lived. I remember, I believe Leroy used to stand here in this very place, in this very spot, and he would ask, how many does that leave out? <laughs> all means all here. We all have chosen our own way. I don't think that we would accept the need for any help unless we followed our own way, unless we saw the results of this world, unless we experienced the failures that we're all prone to experience. Among whom we all once lived. Where is that? The sons of disobedience was at the end of verse 2. In verse 3 here, we see it described as the children of wrath. I find it interesting, and by the way, I have the wrong verse here. I was studying before services, and uh, Sharon was sitting next to me. I said, ha, (laughs) I'm glad I found that. It's chapter 5, verse 6, not chapter 8. 8 is a beautiful verse, too. But chapter, verse 6, is the verse that we want. We are children of disobedience. We have been children of disobedience. When we read in verse 3, the children of wrath, I thought that had to do with the wrath within the children. But how do we respond to disobedient children? Inappropriate wrath. And you see what verse 3 is saying, that when we have submitted ourselves to the rule of Satan, to the ruler of this world, we are children of disobedience and therefore children subject to divine wrath. There are times, I know this is going to be difficult for you to believe. There are times, I, Evie's so quiet, I don't pick on her as much as the other do. There are times that I am justly angry with Evie. Do you believe that, Eve? Do you agree with that? Okay. I, I didn't want to make accusations without giving her a chance to defend herself. I am justly angry with her. And I might add, for her sake, vice versa. Dad makes mistakes in life. And there are times when she is justly angry with me. We're talking about a divine wrath because we are disobedient from the true true light, the true um, source of life in our world. Chapter, or verse 6 of chapter 5 reads, Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, we've just talked in this chapter about a list of sins. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. I wanted to go to that verse because I believe it brings those ideas of the sons of disobedience and the children of wrath together. And makes us understand that separate and apart from Christ, the state that we are in. We're in a disowned state with God. In verses 4 through 10, we see that Christ made us alive. In verses 4 through 6, back here once again in the second chapter, we read, But God, being rich in his mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace, you are saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places. In verse 6 here we see the motive in the manifestation. The motive of God is his amazing love. Look at verse 4 again. But God being rich in his mercy. Why? Why? Because of the great love with which he loved us. That's God's motive. He has not saved me. He's not had mercy on me because I'm something special. He's had mercy on me because he's loved me. He has reached out. He has offered his son for you because he has loved you. The manifestation of that love or the showing of that love is in his mercy. 
He's had a great amount of mercy. Back to that question that I believe as Christians we must answer in light of Scripture. Why would God punish most of the world? Because we deserve it. Getting what we do not deserve is mercy. And God has loved us so much that he's extended that mercy to us. In verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace are we saved. I believe this parenthetical statement is made at the end. It's going to be elaborated, of course, on by verse 8. But we are saved by grace. What's that getting at? He saved us while we were dead in our sins. He didn't save a righteous Mike. He did not save me because of some wonderful works that I've done. He saved me while I was dead. We need to pray for Paul. He's had a lot of breathing issues. He's not getting to the source of the problems why he wasn't here this morning. But he came in last week and I said, how are you doing? He says, well, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sick. And I can't remember what he said, but he made a statement something about, but I'm not dead. That's what he said, but I'm not dead. I said, well, that's good. You can be very, very, very sick and still get better, but get just a little bit dead, and there's no recovery. Right? And here is where Jesus saved us. I wasn't really, really, really sick. I was dead in my sins. I can't get better from that point. I can't help myself. But Jesus made me alive and he did it by saving me through grace. In verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable richness of his grace and the kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Why did he do these things? Verse 7 starts with, so that in the coming ages... Most people or many people are divided over what this means in the coming ages. I believe that like most likely it's a dual meaning. In the coming ages, throughout time, Jesus made this covenant. He extended himself through this sacrifice. He extended his mercy and his grace to us some 2,000 years ago. And throughout all these ages... That immeasurable richness of grace has been shown. But I believe also that in the time to come when we are eternally saved and changed into our immortal states, that in that age we will truly see the immeasurable grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. We get a foretaste of those blessings now. But there's so much better and so much more to come. Verses 8 through 10, where we will conclude our lesson for tonight. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of the works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This needed to be emphasized to the Jews of this time. Judaism was about trying to save yourself through good actions. We hear it today and I believe the Jews have very similar concept of those scales. I'm going to put my good works over here and of course my evil works are over here and somehow they're going to weigh out. Or I hope they weigh out or my good outweighs my bad. We will never accomplish it. We will never get there. We are saved by grace. He's saying to those Jewish Christians primarily, it's not through the keeping of the law. It's a gift of God. I don't get to boast and say, boy, look what I've done. It's interesting to me, so many people today argue against baptism and they argue against it on the nature that it is a work. 
Brother Nair's work spoke about in this passage. But it's not in baptism. Don't misunderstand me. Baptism is the gateway that God has given us. I'm just saying that's the easy part. That's not work. Work is what I do after I experience the grace of God. Work is what I read of in verse 9. Not a result of your works that no man can boast. Excuse me in verse 10. But we are his workmanship. This word is amazing to me. I am God's, the Greek word is poma. P-O-E-M-A. Take that A off and that word looks familiar, doesn't it? <coughs> Do you realize that you are God's poem? This is the Greek word that we get the word poem from. You say, he didn't create you anew for you to be just like you were. He's created you anew to be his workmanship, to be his new creation, to be his poem to the world. He created us in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There's no amount of works that can save me. I can only submit myself to the will of God. I don't believe that he could make it any clearer that I must submit myself in belief of Jesus Christ. That I must submit myself in the form of confessing before men that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That I must submit myself to living a new life of repentance to submitting myself to being buried in baptism, to rise anew in a new life, in a new walk, being God's poem, striving every day to do good works. Not so Mike gets the glory, but that so when men look at my works, we will see our Heavenly Father and glorify Him. This evening, if you're subject to that gospel call, don't delay, don't wait, but rather come forward and make your need known as together we stand and sing.